Hi everyone! I know that this is a real tearjerker because it's our last lecture recording for medical terminology. So uh, try not to be too sad if this is the last one, uh, but we are going to cover the last two lessons in our textbook, which is lesson 11, which covers the nervous system and behavioral health, and then lesson 12, which is going to cover the endocrine system. So let's get started. All right, so first let's talk about some structures of the nervous system. So when we say nervous system, what does that entail? Well, the biggest component is the brain. And the brain is the central organ of the nervous system and it is housed within our skull bones and its job is co to coordinate all activities that go on in the body and to also process sensory information that comes to it via the nerve pathways. All right, so there are uh, several sections to the brain which include the cerebellum, the cerebrum, and the brainstem. And I have an image coming up, so uh, stay tuned for that. Now the brainstem is the stem-like portion that comes down from the brain, and we usually refer to that as the medulla oblongata, and it's comprised of the midbrain, the pons, and then that medulla. Right. Um, it is the connection between the brain and the spinal cord, and it also contains control centers that regulate automatic processes that go on in our body, the things that we don't need to think about, like breathing and heart rate. All right, and then lastly on this slide is the term central nervous system. So when we say central nervous system, we are referring to two specific structures of the nervous system, and that is the brain and the spinal cord. Now, the cerebellum is located under the back portion of the largest part of the brain, which is the cerebrum. So the cerebellum sits beneath and towards the back, posteriorly, um, of the cerebrum. And its job is to assist in the coordination of skeletal muscle, as well as help us to maintain our balance. Now there is this special fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord, and it is called cerebrospinal fluid, and we abbreviate this as CSF. And this cerebral spinal fluid is predominantly made of water, but it does have some sugars and some other um, minerals and electrolytes and, and proteins floating around in there. But uh, for all essential purposes, it is a clear, uh, colorless fluid, and it is born, it is created in these little spaces within the brain called ventricles. And I have a picture of that coming up as well. Um, so the job of the cerebral spinal fluid, it's to cushion the brain and spinal cord from shock. So if we clunk our head, um, uh, hopefully it reduces the impact because our brain is literally floating in our skull. That's why concussion is a thing. Um, if our head hits against something, then that causes our brain to hit against the side of the head. So it does help um, with shock, but it doesn't completely prevent it. It also transports nutrients and then um, it clears metabolic waste as well. Now the cerebrum, like I said, is that biggest portion of the brain and it is divided into two halves, which we call the left and the right hemispheres. And interestingly with our sight, the optic nerves um, 
leave the back of the eye and they actually cross over. So it's the right side of our brain that's interpreting images from the left eye and the left side of the brain that's interpreting images from the right eye, which I think is really interesting. A couple other terms, the meninges. The meninges are these coverings of the brain, protective coverings of the brain. And there are three layers to the meninges. The outermost is the dura or the dura mater. A lot of times we just refer to it as the dura. The middle layer, which is this delicate web-like layer, and because of that web-like structure, gets the name arachnoid layer, arachnoid like arachnid spider, right? And then the innermost layer that's actually um, the deepest layer of the meninges is called the pia mater, and that's the thinnest most delicate layer of those three meningeal layers. Now the nerves. The nerves are these bundles of fibers that carry impulses uh, both away from the brain and back to the brain. So this interconnected highway of fibers that are transporting bazillions of bits of information, just like any cords or wires that you would see hooked up to your computer. Um, they work via electricity the same way that our appliances do and our lamps and in, in our homes do, anything that you would plug in. Uh, these guys are like the wires right, of our bodies. And then lastly on this slide, the peripheral nervous system, which is the, the extension, right, of the, the brain and spinal cord. So they, uh, these peripheral nerves extend from the brain and from the spinal cord, and they also come back to the brain and the spinal cord. And their job, again, it's the same as all nerves in the body. Um, their job is to carry impulses to uh, the brain and away from the brain to the rest of the body. Now the spinal cord is a tube-like bundle of nerves and it traverses down the middle of our vertebral column and it extends from the brain stem into the lower portion of the lumbar spine. And again, its job is to conduct nerve impulses to and from the brain. And then lastly, those ventricles. The ventricles are those little spaces within the brain that house the cerebral spinal fluid, and they also make it. All right, so let's look at some pictures here. So you can see, let's start on this top left one. At the very top of it, you see the brain with all the, the skull and the tissue stripped away. And you can see that there are several lobes to the brain. Um, the, the biggest section that you see in the green, purple, pink, and kind of peachy orange, that is the cerebrum, again, the largest part. And right now we're looking at just half of it, right? One hemisphere of the brain, um, which would be the right hemisphere. And then um, at the base of the cerebrum, that pink uh, blob that you see there, that is the cerebellum. And then that long structure that you see extending down from the cerebrum, that is the spinal cord. And then the other image um, within this top left image is a kind of a cross section and you can see a cross section of the brainstem, the cerebellum, the cerebrum and the skull and uh, you can see some other more intricate structures in there as well. Um, and then the bottom right image is uh, in purple you can see the various ventricles and these ventricles are all connected together. But that's where the cerebral spinal fluid uh, is produced. Um, and then just 
to keep things interesting, I thought you guys might be curious to know, like, what do, what are the different parts, the different lobes responsible for? So the frontal lobe is this reddish one here, and so that's the very front of the brain, like right behind our forehead, and it's responsible for thinking, memory, behavior, and movement. So if there was damage to this area of the brain, then we would have difficulty, uh, the, the individual could potentially have difficulty performing these functions. Uh, the blue portion is called the parietal lobe, and if you were to put your hand right smack on the top of your head, you would be right above the parietal lobe. And uh, this area of the brain is predominantly responsible for language and touch. And then this little green piece um, back here of the cerebrum is called the occipital lobe. So if you were to put your hand at the very back of your skull, um, you would be right on top of the occipital lobe. And this is where the optic nerve terminates. Is it not interesting that, uh, you know, you would think, well, it's at the front of our head. They should, you know, the sight should be processed in the front of our brain, but not true. The optic nerves um, continue all the way back to the occipital nerve, and the right one goes to the left, and the left one goes to the right. But occipital lobe responsible for sight. So if there was damage to the occipital lobe, then there could potentially be damage um, uh, or interruption of sight. And then this yellowy um, section here that's on the side of the cerebrum that is called the temporal lobe. So if you were to put your hands where kind of by your right above your ears, um, that is where the temporal lobes live. There's one on the right and one on the left. And it makes sense that they are, um, they play an integral role in hearing but also in learning and feeling as well. And now this is just a very simplified, um, ver you know, um, discussion of what the different parts do, but just so you have an idea. And then just a reminder that orange um, part at the base, that's the cerebellum, and it's responsible for balance and coordination. And then you can see the brainstem extending down. It's that purplish little snake-like tube and um, it's responsible for a lot of those automatic or autonomic processes that go in on, on in our body that we don't have to think about, like regulating our breathing, our heart rate, and our temperature. So here we're looking at an image of the peripheral nervous system. So remember we said the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Now the peripheral nervous system is all the other nerves. So if you look at this um, image on the left where you see the brain and spinal cord in kind of an orangey red and then all of those blue lines, right? All those blue lines represent the peripheral nervous system where the orange red represents the central nervous system. So, <clears throat> to recap, functions of the nervous system. First, they control and integrate all body functions, all right? We cease to exist uh, without the functioning of our nervous system. It uh, also is a communication pathway, an electrical communication pathway. And then thirdly, it's responsible for mental activity, thought, and memory. So let's look at some word parts. <clears throat> uh, cerebro is the combining form for cerebrum or just a, an overall generalization of the brain. Encephalo is also used as a word part for brain. And then meningo or meningeo are, is used to refer to the meninges. Uh, the spinal cord. Myelo. Do not get this confused with myo, which is muscle. So M Y E L O is the spinal cord. Okay, this comes from uh, a term that we will learn in anatomy and physiology myelin. And myelin is the protective covering or sheath 
of the, the nerves, all right? So myelo meaning spinal cord. And then phaso is the word part for <clears throat> Now plago, plagio is the combining form for paralysis and polio is the combining form for gray matter. So our brain and spinal cord are made up of two types of matter, white and gray. And in the brain, the gray matter is on the outside while the white matter is on the inside. And then with the spinal cord, it is the reverse. Now, psycho is the word part for mind. And I know a lot of times if we use that term, we're meaning someone's a little bit crazy, uh, but it actually means mind. And then quadri means four. So think of a quad has four parts to it, a quadrant, um, for example. And then uh, the suffix us uh, is just something that we add on the end to make it a little bit more easier to pronounce. A uh, couple of prefixes here, hemi, which means half, and then micro, which means small. So some medical terms built from word parts. The first one is cerebral, and cerebral, remember AL means pertaining to, and cerebro means cerebrum, so pertaining to the cerebrum. Cerebral angioplasty, remember we had, we heard the word angioplasty when we were in the cardiovascular uh, lesson, and uh, so an angio, um, an angiography is um, a radiographic imaging of the blood vessels. Now here we're specifically speaking to those pertaining to the cerebrum. Cerebral thrombosis, remember the word thrombosis, right? The condition of having a clot. So this is the abnormal condition of a clot in the cerebrum. An electroencephalogram, often abbreviated as EEG, is a record of electrical activity of the brain. And the electroencephalograph is the instrument that we use to record that activity of the brain. And then an electroencephalography is the process of recording. So remember, gram is the record, graph is the instrument, and graphy is the process. And then lastly on this slide, encephalitis. Remember, encephalo means brain, and itis means inflammation. So here we're talking about inflammation of the brain. Encephalopathy, remember pathy, that means disease. Encephalo means brain, so encephalopathy means disease of the brain. Neural means pertaining to the nerves, and neuralgia means pain in the nerves. Remember, algia means pain, neuro means nerve. A neurologist is a physician who studies and treats the nervous system, and neurology is the study of the nerves. Now, if there's neuropathy, that means there's a disease uh, of the nerves. And then inflammation of many joints. Remember, we saw the prefix before poly, which means many. And arthro, we already saw that in our musculoskeletal lesson, which means joint, and itis means the inflammation of. So polyarthritis is the inflammation of many joints. Polymyalgia. Remember, algia is pain, poly is mini, and here we have myo, which means muscle. Don't get that confused with myelo, which means spinal cord. And lastly on this slide, polyneuritis. Remember, itis means inflammation, poly means many, and neuro means nerves. So here we have inflammation of many nerves. A few more for us. Aphasia, remember we said phaso is speech. So here aphasia is condition of without speech or the loss of the ability to speak or the inability to speak. Cephalgia is pain in the head and dysphagia is a condition of difficulty with speech. Don't get this confused with 
aphasia that's spelled with a G. Remember, that's swallowing. If we have an S, that means speech. Remember, S for speech. Hemiplasia. Remember, hemi means half. So here we have a condition of paralysis of half of the body. And then hydrocephalus. Remember, hydro means water, right? And us doesn't really mean anything at all, but cephalo means the head. Okay, so here we have um, water in the head, and the water that they're talking about is the cerebrospinal fluid, all right, the CSF. So uh, an overproduction of cerebral spinal fluid or the inability for it to drain and be reabsorbed can lead to a condition called hydrocephalus, and, and it's typically a congenital disorder, and um, the, the kind of street name for it is water on the brain, all right? And this uh, causes an extreme amount of pressure inside the cranium, and that can damage the brain. A meningioma is a tumor of the meninges, and meningitis is inflammation of those meninges. And then lastly, remember seal, C-E-L-E, -L -E, is a hernia. So meningocele is a hernia of the meninges. Continuing on here with a few more, um, meningomyelitis is inflammation of the meninges and the spinal cord. Remember myelo means spinal cord. Microcephalus, that means small head. And myelogram is the radiographic image of the spinal cord. Remember, myelography is the process of making that recording. And then pyelomyelitis, or poliomyelitis, excuse me, is inflammation of the gray matter of the spinal cord. Remember, polio means gray matter. Psychogenic, remember, IC is pertaining to. Psycho is mind, and genic is originating from. So psychogenic is originating in the mind. Um, sometimes individuals will come in and they think that they have signs and symptoms, but they really don't. And uh, we can't find any signs of it, and so we refer to that as psychogenic. And then psychologist is the individual that specializes and studies uh, the and treats the mind. Psychology is the study of the mind and psychopathy or psychopathy, however you want to say it, um, refers to a disease of the mind. And then a psychosis is an abnormal condition of the mind and usually this is um, some sort of major mental disorder that's characterized by a variety of different um, signs and symptoms like hallucinations, delusions, those kinds of things. Uh, and then lastly here on this slide, quadriplegia. Remember, plasia is the paralysis of and quad means four. So this is the condition of the paralysis of all four limbs. All right, how about some medical terms that are not built from word parts? Uh, the first one listed here is uh, Alzheimer's disease. And um, we usually abbreviate this as AD, capital AD for Alzheimer's disease. And this is a type of dementia. Now, again, if we live long enough, just like I said with cataracts, um, if we live long enough, we're going to start to have some um, signs of Alzheimer's, all right? Um, so this is caused by the degeneration of brain tissue, um, and it occurs more frequently after the age of, of 65. But what happens is the brain tissue starts to um, atrophy because the nerve cells start to die more quickly and it leaves these little things called plaques in the brain which can be seen on radiographic images and because of these plaques there's these gaps in um, the communication pathway within the brain and so that can result in an, an inability to remember the past. And in, in, the, in the beginning, in the early stages of Alzheimer's, it's more like short-term memory, right? Like 
you can't remember what you had for breakfast, you know, a day ago. And then as it progresses, it starts to chip into that long-term memory as well. Um, anxiety disorder is a disorder that is very common in individuals these days, and it's characterized by feelings of apprehension, tension and uneasiness and also the feeling that one is um, in danger in some way. Bipolar disorder is a psychological disorder and it is characterized by a disturbance in moods. So these big mood swings, it can be um, really happy and then angry, or really happy and then really sad, or um, and it seems to alternate between the two. Um, a concussion is an injury to the brain caused by some sort of head trauma, which uh, symptoms can include headache, vertigo, and sometimes loss of consciousness, can also cause bleeding on the brain. Dementia is a cognitive impairment, again, where patients have difficulty in various ways, which could include performing complex tasks, reasoning, learning and retaining new information, orientation, remembering where they live, um, being able to recall words uh, effectively, and it also can um, elicit behavioral changes as well. Depression is a mood disturbance that's characterized by feelings of sadness, despair, discouragement, hopelessness, lack of joy, altered sleep patterns, and difficulty with decision making and daily functioning. And it can range from normal feelings of sadness. It can also bring on anxiety attacks um, as well. Um, it can also be very minor, all right? So, uh, and, and then, you know, there's various degrees on the spectrum there. Now, an epidural nerve block is a procedure that's performed on the spine, and it's typically to alleviate pain. Now, a lot of times, uh, individuals that are um, in labor, they will have an epidural. That's we usually just call it an epidural and not an epidural nerve block, but they'll have the epidural and um, that is going to disrupt those neural pathways as far as pain response goes. All right, they'll still feel pressure. Uh, they'll still know when to push so that they can push um, the baby uh, through the birth canal, but they won't have pain. All right, and it's a, a little catheter that is inserted into the, um, the epidural space. A lumbar puncture <clears throat> um, is a diagnostic procedure, and with this, they insert a needle into the subarachnoid space where that cerebral spinal fluid lives, and they're going to draw out some fluid for testing. Sometimes we also refer to this as a spinal tap. Now, a migraine is an intense, horribly painful headache. Um, a lot of times it's on one side of the head or the other, but it can lead to irritability, nausea, vomiting, and extreme sensitivity to light or sound. I remember when I was a kid, my mom had these, and, um, you know, she would just... I think they were brought on by stress, but she had a very stressful job and the whole weekend she would spend in bed with a migraine sometimes and, you know, we had to be really quiet and keep the lights off and, um, and uh, they would make her uh, very sick. Multiple sclerosis, often abbreviated as MS, is a chronic degenerative disease, and it's characterized by these sclerotic patches or hardened patches along the brain and spinal cord. and. Uh, the signs and symptoms can fluctuate over the course of the disease, um, but common symptoms include fatigue, balance and coordination impairments, numbness, and or vision problems. Now, paraplegia, paraplegia is paralysis from the waist down, all right, and this is caused by damage to the lower level of the spinal cord. Not to be confused with hemiplegia, which is like the right side of the body or the half side of, or the uh, right side of the body. Parkinson's disease, abbreviated PD, is also a chronic degenerative disease 
um, but specifically of the central nervous system. And um, if you remember Michael J. Fox, he is an individual that was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so this results in uncontrollable tremors of the hands and feet, also difficulty making facial expressions, um, inability to uh, you know, walk with a normal gait, and can eventually result in dementia as well. Um, and it usually occurs in individuals over 50 years of age, but Michael J. Fox was a lot younger than that when he was diagnosed. Um, but they are doing some, <clears throat> um, there's some groundbreaking work with radio frequency um, that they are using that is seeming to be helpful with treating Parkinson's disease. Um, it's really difficult to treat things that go on inside the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier is made up of these specialized nervous cells that um, join together very tightly and they keep out a lot of dangerous stuff. But on the flip side of the coin, they also keep out medications that we could potentially use to treat things that are going on inside there. A, a psychiatrist is a physician with additional training and they um, are experienced with diagnosing, preventing, and treating various mental disorders. And they can also prescribe medications and direct additional therapies. Sciatica is inflammation of the sciatic nerve. And uh, <clears throat> this causes pain that travels from the buttocks down the leg and into the foot and the toes. And it can definitely um, be caused by injury or infection, fatigue, arthritis, herniated disc, those kinds of things. Sitting can also cause sciatica. Uh, seizures are sudden abnormal surges of electrical activity in the brain, and this can result in um, involuntary body movements or behaviors. A stroke is an interruption of blood supply to a region of the brain. And when this happens, uh, it's usually due to a clot and uh, it's going to deprive nerve cells in the area of oxygen and nutrients. And sometimes we also refer to a stroke as a CVA, which stands for cerebrovascular accident. A subarachnoid hemorrhage, SAH, is bleeding between the meninges of the brain, so between the pia and the arachnoid layer, but below the dura, all right? So within the meninges itself. And uh, this is typically caused by some sort of rupture of a vessel, um, usually some sort of aneurysm. All right, and the patient can experience intense sudden headaches that can be accompanied by nausea and vomiting and also neck pain. Um, this is an emergent situation that needs to be recognized and treated right away to prevent brain damage or death. Uh, I forgot to change my slide. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> Here we are. Um, so subarachnoid hemorrhage we just talked about, and then a couple more, syncope. So syncope is uh, fainting or sudden loss of consciousness called by lack of blood supply to the brain. Um, my mom was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation some years ago, and it, it was not as severe at first, but as time went on, her symptoms got more severe and more severe, and um, she started having episodes of syncope. The first one was uh, she was taking, uh, she had this little old dog that had bad hips and uh, they had stairs that went down to their backyard. And so she was taking her down so that she could do her business. And my mom had an episode of syncope because her heart was in, uh, was fibrillating, which means it's not really beating and pushing blood to parts of the body like it should, uh, including the brain. And so she fainted on the stairs and she fell and she broke her hand and uh, then she had a couple more episodes and uh, which scared the heck out of us until they uh, finally put in a pacemaker and uh, that keeps her out of atrial fibrillation which uh, stop the syncope. But um, if you're not getting oxygen to your brain, then your brain is going to uh, shut down. 
Uh, and then lastly, transient ischemic attack. And uh, this is a sudden deficient supply of blood to the brain lasting a short time, and symptoms are usually similar to those of a stroke or that cerebrovascular accident that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> but uh, different from that, they're usually temporary and uh, they expect full recovery from TIAs. Um, but they're often warning signs for an eventual occurrence of a stroke. All right, let's look at some abbreviations. So the first one is AD. This will pretty much be an, um, um, a review for us. AD is Alzheimer's disease. And then ADL or ADLs uh, is the abbreviation for activities of daily living. The things that we do every day to care for ourselves, like be able to take a shower or brush our hair or put on our clothes and, and get food for ourselves. <clears throat> CNS is the abbreviation for central nervous system. Remember, that's the brain and the spinal cord. And then CSF is that cerebrospinal fluid, that special fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord, nourishes it, and protects it. A CVA is a cerebrovascular accident. That's the stroke that we talked about. EEG is the abbreviation for electroencephalogram. Remember, this is the record of the electrical activity of the heart. LP is the abbreviation for lumbar puncture. Remember, sometimes we need to remove the fluid and test it, maybe if we suspect something like meningitis. And then MS is the abbreviation for multiple sclerosis. A couple more here. PD is how we abbreviate Parkinson's disease. And PNS is the abbreviation for peripheral nervous system. So that's every part of the nervous system aside from brain and spinal cord. SAH is that subarachnoid hemorrhage, and lastly, TIA, which is uh, the abbreviation for transient ischemic attack. Some clinical categories. So here we're looking to see, is it a diagnostic test or equipment, or is it a sign and symptom? So the first one, electroencephalograph, is a diagnostic, a piece of diagnostic, um, equipment or diagnostic test. Remember that's to record the electrical activity of the brain. Neuralgia is a sign or symptom. Remember neuralgia is pain uh, of the nerves. <clears throat> uh, myelography is a diagnostic test. Um, uh, remember that's testing the spinal cord. Okay, And then um, polymyalgia that's a sign or symptom. Remember, that's pain of the um, of many muscles. And then lumbar puncture is a diagnostic test. All right, one more slide here for clinical categories is, is it a disease or disorder or a related term? And so the first one, dementia, that is a disease or a disorder. Remember, it's a progressive disease where individuals forget Thanks, they have memory loss. Cerebral means pertaining to the cerebrum, remember, so that's a, a related term. An anxiety disorder, that's a disorder. And then psychopathy is a disease disorder. And then lastly, psychogenic is a related term. Remember, it means pertaining to coming from the mind or originating in the mind. All right, so that is um, all that I have for lesson 11. So um, our very last lesson that we're gonna talk about is the endocrine system. So let's get started. All right, so the endocrine system, let's talk about the various structures and what their jobs are. For the endocrine system. So the first one is the adrenal glands. Now we have two adrenal glands and they sit atop the kidneys. Uh, one of my students in the past said they're the top hats of the kidneys. So if you want to remember the adrenal glands are the top hats of the kidneys. Uh, that might help you remember where they are. Um, but they are located above the kidneys and they secrete a variety of hormones including the ones that kick in during fight or flight, 
I don't know if you've uh, heard of that term or not, but uh, a part of our um, peripheral nervous system is our fight or flight uh, response. And um, so if you've ever been in a situation where you might have to fight or, or flee, or um, maybe you encountered a snake or a scorpion or a bear, or maybe you just feel scared getting up and giving a presentation in front of class, all of those things are uh, situations where our fight or flight response uh, kind of comes into play, and uh, that is thanks to our adrenal glands. Now, hormones are chemicals that are secreted by these glands, and they are like the chemical communication in our body, right? The nerves are the electrical communication pathways, but hormones are these substances that are carried by the blood or to a target tissue. So if they're carried by the blood, they can travel long distances. But there are chemical substances such as ones called prostaglandins. And prostaglandins are produced um, by a tissue and they kind of permeate out into the nearby tissue and they are just responsible for um, controlling localized situations. The islets of longer haunts, they are these very specialized um, clusters of tissue that are found in the pancreas. And they're made up of a couple different types of cells that secrete various hormones. And one of those hormones is insulin. Uh, the other one is called glucagon. But these Hormones that are secreted by the islets of longer hans help to regulate blood glucose levels. Now, metabolism. We've probably all heard of this, like, oh, the older I get, the slower my metabolism is. Um, I know that's true for me. <laughs> um, but a metabolism, by definition, is the sum total of all of the chemical processes that take place in a living organism. So it's not just about losing weight or gaining weight, right? It's all of those chemical processes. Now, the pancreas. The pancreas is where those islets of Langerhans are. It is both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. So exocrine gland, meaning it, it, it produces those digestive juices that we talked about, and it secretes them into the duodenum. An endocrine gland secretes hormones into the bloodstream, all right? So the pancreas is both. It is a kind of tongue-shaped organ, if you will, that uh, lies transversely across the upper abdomen. And like I said, it plays a role in digestion as well as secreting hormones that regulate um, blood glucose levels. The pituitary gland, uh, I think I have mentioned before, it's a pea-sized gland, it's very small, and it's located at the base of the brain. So basically right behind the nose. Um, if you were to reach in there, um, you could probably grab your pituitary. Um, but the job of the pituitary is to produce um, and secrete hormones that stimulate functions of other glands. So this, a lot of times we refer to as the master gland because it drives all the other uh, glands functioning. Uh, the thymus gland is a lymphatic organ. We talked about it when we talked about the immune system and the terminology associated with that. But it is located behind the sternum, so behind the breastbone, right? Um, and it plays an important role, like we said, in the development of the body's immune system. It produces T cells, and T cells are an, play an integral role in our body's ability to protect itself from foreign invaders. And then lastly, the thyroid gland. Well, the thyroid gland is a butterfly-shaped gland and it is in the neck. It is anterior um, to the neck and inferior to the larynx. 
and it secretes hormones that regulate metabolism of carbohydrates as well as proteins and fats needed for growth. And then it also regulates something called the basal metabolic rate. And the basal metabolic rate is basically how many calories it takes for us to just be a couch potato, to just for our body to do the things that it needs to do to keep us alive, like heartbeat and breathe and cellular respiration and digestion and those kinds of things. All right, so the thyroid gland controls all of those things. All right, and here's a picture of all of those glands. All right, we, we talked about how the reproductive organs of the male and female are also endocrine glands, but we're not specifically covering them here because we talked about them in a previous lesson. So functions of the endocrine system, just to recap, the first one is that it regulates body activities, right? It's chemical communications through substances called hormones. And it also influences growth, development, metabolism, puberty, fight or flight, so many different processes that hormones influence in our bodies. So let's talk about some word parts. Adrenal O is the combining form for adrenal gland and crino means to secrete. So endocrine, right, is to secrete within, right? We're specifically uh, referring to secreting within a vessel, right? Where exocrine would be to secrete outside of that, right? Um, dipso refers to thirst, which is one that uh, usually is a little bit more difficult to remember, dipso. Glyco is the word part for sugar. Thymo is the word part for thymus. And thyroid is a word part for thyroid gland. Uh, suffix that we should be aware of is ism. And ism refers to the state of something. So let's look at some medical terms that are built from these different word parts. The first one is agromegaly, and uh, that G should be a C, so I apologize for that. But remember that acro means extremity, and megaly means the enlargement of. So here we have enlargement of the extremities, and a lot of times this impacts the facial features as well. They'll have a bit of very long face. An adenoma is a tumor composed of a gland or glandular tissue. So remember, oma is tumor and adeno is gland. An adrenalectomy would be uh, the excision of adrenal gland because ectomy refers to the excision of. Remember, otomy is the incision into. Inflammation of the adrenal gland, that term is adrenalitis. An enlargement of one or both of the adrenal glands is adrenomegaly. Now, the term to secrete within is endocrine and a physician who studies and treats the diseases of the endocrine system is called an endocrinologist. If there are diseases of the endocrine system, then we refer to that as endocrinopathy. Now glycemia, remember glyco means sugar and emia, uh, or yeah, emia means uh, condition of the blood. So here we have a condition of sugar in the blood. Remember, we look at the first part is the component, and then the next part is where we find it. So something in something, sugar in the blood. Hyperglycemia, remember hyper means too much. So here we have too much sugar in the blood. Uh, Hyperthyroidism, remember again, hyper meaning too much, so we have too much thyroid activity. It's putting out too much hormones, right? Too fast of a metabolism now. 
hypoglycemia is the opposite of hyperglycemia, and it means not enough sugar in the blood. Hypothyroidism, again, is the opposite of hyperthyroidism, and it means a state of deficient thyroid activity. We're on not enough thyroid hormones being put out. <clears throat> Um, polydipsia is a condition of being really thirsty, all right, and this is usually a uh, sign that we see in individuals with uncontrolled diabetes. Polyuria is a condition of much urine, okay, so there's uh, an excessive amount of urine. And then thymectomy, remember thymo means thymus, ectomy means the excision of. So thymectomy is the excision of the thymus gland. Thymic, remember IC means pertaining to, so here thymic is pertaining to the thymus gland. Thioma is a tumor of the, ther the thymus gland. I almost said thermos for some reason. Uh, and then thyroidectomy is an excision of the thyroid gland. And then lastly, an inflammation of the thyroid gland would be thyroiditis. Okay, so let's look at some medical terms that are not built from word parts. And the first one is Addison disease. Now, Addison disease is a chronic syndrome, and it is a result of not enough secretion of hormones from the adrenal glands. The way I remember this is add. We need to add more hormones because there is not enough. All right, so there's a deficiency. Um, some symptoms of Addison disease is weight loss, hypotension, which is low blood pressure, and skin darkening. Um, and sometimes we also refer to this as uh, primary adrenal insufficiency. Uh, another medical term not built from word parts is diabetes mellitus. And this is a chronic disease involving the um, a disorder of carbohydrate metabolism. And there's two different types. There's type 1 and type 2. Um, but it mainly has to do with not having uh, sufficient insulin or the body not being able, uh, the body having insulin resistance. So uh, in the case of uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, that's usually a congenital thing that the individual is born with, whereas type 2 diabetes is more like adult onset where we develop a resistance to insulin. All right, and so what happens is the, there Insulin is what binds with sugar in the blood to turn it into glycogen so it can be stored or make it uh, make it available to the cells, right, um, for later use. But when there's insulin resistance or there's not enough insulin, then too much sugar remains in the blood, and this can cause elevated blood sugar. Now, a fasting blood sugar, or FBS, is a blood test, and this blood test is used to determine the amount of sugar or glucose in the blood um, when an individual has been fasting. And usually they ask for an eight to 10 hour fast, um, because if we eat before that, taking that blood sugar, that could alter the results. Uh, a fine needle aspiration, FNA. This is a biopsy technique, and there's um, uh, they use a hollow needle, and that actually gets a little bit of tissue that can be sent to pathology for examination. And um, you know the the book specifically refers to thyroid, but we can do you know needle aspiration biopsies on a variety of organs, the liver, um, you know whatever. Uh, the next one on the list here is glycosylated hemoglobin, and that's the HbA1c. So if you've ever had um, a blood panel done and it's one of the things that's listed is your A1C. Um, and that is used to diagnose diabetes and also monitor its treatment. So it's gonna also measure the amount of glucose in the blood. And um, it's gonna give us an indication of the blood sugar level over like 
um, 120 day um, span. A goiter, a goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid gland. And a lot of times this happens with hypothyroidism. Uh, the thyroid is trying to uh, it fix itself, right? It's not producing enough hormones. And so it starts to enlarge itself to try to produce more of those hormones. Um, a Graves disease is um, characterized by hyperthyroidism, all right, hyperthyroidism. And um, it uh, can cause uh, protrusion of the eyes and those types of things. And then metabolic syndrome is a group of signs and symptoms that include um, insulin resistance, obesity, hypertension, hyperglycemia, elevated uh, triglycerides, which are cholesterols, and then um, low levels of good cholesterol, which is the high density lipoprotein or HDL. The low density is the bad kind. The high density is the good kind. Uh, sometimes we also refer to this as insulin resistance syndrome or syndrome X. All right, let's look at some abbreviations. Um, the first one is DM, which is the abbreviation for diabetes mellitus. FBS is the fasting blood sugar. FNA is fine needle aspiration. Uh, HbA1c is the glycosylated hemoglobin. T1DM is, as I mentioned, type 1 diabetes, and T2DM is type 2 diabetes. So let's look at some clinical categories. All right, here we're looking at specialties and diseases slash disorders. So adrenalitis. Inflammation of the adrenal glands, that's definitely a disease slash disorder. Endocrinology, this is the individuals that uh, are, this is the study of the endocrine system, so that would be a specialty. And then thyroiditis, anybody remember what that is? That is inflammation of the thyroid, right? That's a disease disorder. And then an endocrinologist is uh, the individual that studies uh, and treats the diseases of the endocrine system. And then endocrinopathy, that's a disease slash disorder. Remember, that's literally diseases of the endocrine system. A couple more here. We're looking at, is it a disease disorder or a signed symptom? So hyperglycemia. Remember, that is an excess amount of blood, of sugar in the blood. So that's a, a categorized as a sign symptom. Diabetes mellitus is the disease or disorder. Hyperthyroidism, again, uh, the thyroid is producing an excessive amount of hormones. That is a disease slash disorder. Polydipsia is a sign slash symptom, right? This is just being really thirsty. You gotta drink, drink, drink. I remember my parents' dog was, uh, he was a West Highland Terrier and he was diagnosed with diabetes. And uh, what got them clued in to something being wrong with him was he was just constantly drinking. Like he would just drink and drink and drink and drink. And at some points he would drink until he vomited. And so they took him in and they did some tests and they diagnosed him with diabetes. And um, so definitely a sign of that. Uh, and then lastly, adenoma, which is a tumor of the adrenal gland and that would be a disease slash disorder. All right, so uh, that concludes our lessons for medical terminology, and I hope that this was helpful in reviewing the nervous uh, system and behavioral health, as well as the endocrine system. And as always, thank you for listening.